Let's read the word of God together now, shall we, everyone? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results, or another version is it was not a failure. We'd previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, my help, we dare to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know, we never use flattery, nor do we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, and I love this phrase, and we'll dwell on this later, instead, we were like young children among you, and all God's people said, amen. This morning's title is The Beating Heart of a Leader. The Beating Heart of a Leader. We trust that our heart is beating again for Jesus Christ. We trust that the things of God are alive to us. Tim reminded us of the desperate straits that our world is in right now. Isn't this a time for God's people to be alive and awake in him? In fact, if you're thankful for the gospel, if you're thankful for contentment in Jesus Christ, would you praise him right now, everyone? Say thank you to him. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your blessings in our life. George Harrison, the guitarist of the Beatles, Uh, so sadly no longer with us, wrote these lyrics. It's easier to tell a lie than it is to tell the truth. It's easier to kill a fly than to turn it loose. It's easier to criticize somebody else than to see yourself. Clearly here, as the Apostle Paul, after telling the story of how the Thessalonians were converted and how they did, By chapter 2, verse 1, he's clearly responding to the critics that were around him. But as he responds, he shows us the heart of a leader. Tim Woodruff and I were meeting this week, and Tim, you reminded me that were it not for the problems in the church, we wouldn't actually have the epistles. Very often the scriptures came because there were problems in the church, and that's how the word came. And so Paul uh, is taking this criticism. I believe he's taking it very well, by the way. Because Paul was the chief of sinners, and he discovered he didn't need to defend himself. He needed to repent of his sins and get right with God. And so he has a healthy view of himself. But nonetheless, Paul has the opportunity here to rise above the temptation of defensiveness or self-absorption or self-pity. And he lays out here a magnificent manifesto of what leadership and the Christian life is all about. His opponents seem to find it really hard to understand that it's possible for someone to actually live for Jesus with pure motive. And that may well be your life. You're living for Jesus with pure motive, but there are those around you who are suspicious of you that don't really trust you because they live with impure motives themselves. And often that's what happens. A manipulative person thinks that everybody else must be manipulating And a person that does not tell the truth assumes that nobody else tells the truth either. But Paul shows us that it is possible to live completely for Jesus Christ. Let's ask the question, what does the heartbeat of a healthy leader look like? What does a healthy Christian and a healthy culture look like? Well, verse 1 says, you know, brothers and sisters, our visit to you was not without results. Chapter 2, verse 1 refers to all of chapter 1. Having seen how the Thessalonians were born spiritually, Paul then says this was not a waste, even though there were those saying this is a waste. The first thing I want us to see is that spiritual leaders are concerned for right results. Everyone say right results. Spiritual leaders have a sense of the measurement of kingdom results. Now, there's no greater result than someone who is far from God coming to know Jesus Christ being made alive in him and then following Jesus 
with all their heart. That's the greatest result of all, amen? And when that is multiplied, in other words, it's not just one person, but many turning to Christ, you have a movement. You have a revival going on. That's what happened in the early church in Acts chapter two. That's what happened with the Thessalonians. A number came to know the Lord, and that's the sweetest result of all. And the Bible's not afraid or embarrassed to mention numbers from time to time, 3,000 baptized, 5,000 in the church, 156 fish were caught, 10 lepers were healed, and one came back to say thank you, and 5,000 were fed. And sometimes we do that as a church as well. Miss Linda has to estimate how many people to cook for. We, we tend to have a, an idea of how many are going to come to the tree, and how many went out on visitation, and how many going on the, uh, the, the uh, an wildlife safari. And I loved it. Hugh and Mary Lynn took us all that time. Do you remember that? Yeah. I got licked by those rhinoceroses or whatever they were. It wasn't a rhino. It wasn't a rhino. But... Um, but we, we, we kind of have to know how many we have to cater for. But on one occasion, in John chapter 6, when Jesus really laid out the commitment that was requ required to be a follower of Jesus Christ, John 6, verse 66, it's like the Antichrist verse. John 6, 66, the Bible says that at that point, many people stopped following Jesus because Jesus had laid out what the conditions of following him were. And so all the church experts at the time, all the church growth guys would have said, the denomination of Jesus, the Jesus people are now finished because they were big and now they're down to nothing. But let me tell you something, Jesus was only just beginning. They came down to the smallest number and then he was crucified and then he rose again from the dead. Sometimes before the great blessing takes place, there's got to be death and resurrection, Amen. And so the Thessalonians only had three Sabbaths with Paul, and some were clearly mocking this church, saying, ha, this is nothing. Uh, probably the easiest sport to get involved in these days uh, is probably church bashing. It's probably the easiest thing to do of all. It's much harder to build a church than, of course, it is to bash the church. But I think it's really important for us all to always look at ourselves and say, well, did I have a quiet time? And I be, uh, am I in a serving spirit? Is my speech edifying? Have I prayed for an opportunity to share the gospel this week? Am I truly serving and making things better? Paul says, our time with you was not without results. It was not a failure. We don't ultimately let human results become our own ultimate identity. Amen. By the way, I want to bless all the small churches. If anyone's listening on the radio, you're part of a small church. We love small churches at New Hope. Perhaps we do because we used to be a small church. We know how vital it is that God's given you a role in a community, and it's vital that you live for God. You're all out for Him if you're in a small church. It's very easy for us to uh, discard someone or think that they are unimportant, but it's vital for us to know today that we do not labor in vain. Our ministry is not without results. In fact, Paul says that the gospel was becoming known in all of Greece and where also everywhere. The Thessalonian influence was in all of Greece and actually everywhere. So not only was it not without results, it was a great blessing. And yet some were saying, ha, those Thessalonians, they're nothing. And if you come from another church, I'm so sure people will try and say, your church is nothing or new hope is nothing. Let me tell you something in Jesus' name. We are something. God is working in this place. He's got a great vision for this place. We've had great days. I'm going to tell you what, we are going to have great days. It may look different. It may be different, but if we can be obedient to God, we can be sure that God is going to do great things. If you are in faith for God to do great things, would you give him praise, everyone? He's the God of this city. So you say, Reese, what are the worthwhile results? They're there in chapter one. Look on the screen. We've put it kind of all in one big section here. Service. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by the hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Spiritual leaders and Christian people, ministers of the gospel, members of a church are aware that service is a vital kingdom measure. How are we doing? Well, we want to know how many people came to this or that, but I tell you what, if we're serving the Lord, that's a great result, amen? And secondly, character. You became imitators of us and the Lord, you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with joy by the Holy Spirit. You became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Christian 
character is such a vital result. And I thank God for all our groups that all the time, Wednesday, Wednesday nights, Sunday mornings, we're encouraging, we're doing life coaching that we can be more and more like Jesus and then witness. This one so easily gets neglected, but it's really important. It's a vital kingdom measure how are we doing as a church? Well, how are we sharing Jesus Christ? I told you a story of how I invited um, a man to church last week, and I prayed God give me another opportunity to, to uh, invite someone to church. And um, so I was uh, actually, I actually played golf for the first time in a while. Hallelujah. And so I uh, went out with this guy. Um, I won't tell you his name, but Catholic background. And so I was talking to him, and he found out about New Hope. And before I could even... Uh, invite him. He invited himself. He says, I come into your church. I thought, hallelujah. I didn't even have to invite him, so I don't get any credit for that, but he invited himself. Isn't that great? What, what did he do? He invited himself. I think some people are that ready to come along to church that they're about to invite themselves, but I think we're supposed to invite them first. Amen? And so witness is a vital measure for us. So there's the vision. It's about all of Greece. It's about everywhere. It's about our community, our nation, and world. It's about South Metro Atlanta. It's about the county that we live in, the street that we live in, the school that we're in, our sphere of influence around us. We believe that the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. Amen? Has the, has the power of Jesus or has the blood of Jesus lost its power? Has the Holy Spirit gone to sleep or is God as real and as relevant as, as at any point in our history? Sorry, is anybody there right now? Yeah. Absolutely. Jesus is alive. And uh, so, if that is the case, secondly, spiritual leaders will pay the price. And so the apostle says in verse 2, we previously suffered, this refers to Acts chapter 16. Remember the Thessalonians were born in Acts 17. We previously suffered and, be, and had been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dare to show you this gospel in the face of strong opposition. So three references to pain there. Suffering, being treated outrageously, and the Greek there is insulted and suffering abuse, and then strong opposition. John Phillips says they were made of sterner stuff than to be turned aside from their mission like beatings and bonds. What does that mean for us? Pastors, ministers, staff, deacons, Sunday school family group leaders, age grade ministers, ministry leaders, humble servants. What does that mean for us? It means we pay the price. It means that there will be difficult days. It means that our personal preference won't always be met. It means being last in line sometimes. It means staying a little longer or trying a little harder or praying a little bit more or sometimes giving a little bit extra. You know what? We're willing to pay the price because we believe that we've received the pearl of great price. And because we have that precious treasure in our lives, we're willing to give what it takes in order for us to see that treasure more manifest. Can I have an amen on that one? And that's Paul's life that became the Thessalonians' way of living as well. We are willing to pay the price. What are we, everyone? We're willing to pay the price. Would you tell someone right now, I'm willing to pay the price? Go on, you tell them that. Wow. And I trust that this is not like John chapter 6, when everybody but a few walked out the building and said, that sounds too hard for me. No, this is a group that's willing to pay the price. I see you serving everywhere. I see you making a difference. And I think it's time for us to do some fresh things like Hugh and Mary Lynn are doing and saying, you know what, we want to reach people that we're not connecting with at the moment. But you know, when we do this, there will be those that will say, ha, you're a bunch of hypocrites. Ha, I don't trust you. Well, we certainly live in, a, in an untrusting world. But thirdly, Paul was simply sincere. Spiritual leaders have a sincerity about them. Verse 3, and there are two verses that we see here, full of descriptions of insincerity. For our appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. Verse 5, you know we never use flattery. By the way, flattery says things that are not true. Encouragement says things that are true. So be an encourager, pick out things that are true and, and express them. Uh, flattery kind of makes stuff up and says things that simply aren't true. And that was the appeal of some. There are the flatterers of this world. And then we read also that there are those that put on a mask. Everyone say mask. 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 Who said that? Mask. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, sister. It means the same thing, though, doesn't it? 
But, but what happens is that when there's insincerity, we, uh, the face doesn't match the life or the, the external doesn't match what's really going on. And then greed, that's another thing. So I, I've listed here six sins. Look on the screen right now. So there are six sins mentioned from verse three to four that Paul was accused of. And here's the thing, none of them were true. But I generally think people that make that accusation generally themselves are susceptible to error, impure motives, trickery, flattery, putting on a mask and greed. And so they think that the apostle Paul had to have those things as well. But you know, you know and I know as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's possible to operate without those sins, amen? And I encourage you to be pure of motive. I see that you are. I don't want to see us trying to be someone that we're not. But let's be of pure motive. Can I have an amen on that one? I need to mention, there are so many things that we don't talk about every week because we've, well, we cover an issue and an issue will pop up again. So we can't answer everything that's out there all the time. We, we lay out the word of God. We're going through verse by verse. It's hard for me not to think about one particular man who died this week when I look at those words that we've just used there of trickery and deception but um, Hugh Hefner died this week, the, the godfather and founder of the Playboy empire, which has profoundly affected our culture. Maybe someone else would have done it had he not done it, because society will always try and invent ways of doing evil when it turns away from the living God. But I will say this, that uh, first of all, we never mourn the death of anyone. Uh, everyone is precious to Christ. Paul was the chief of sinners. So I just want to say, first of all, anybody can come to know Jesus, amen? We extend the love of Christ. doesn't matter how far we've sinned, how far we've fallen. And even if our life is caught up with, with lust and with sin, Jesus Christ can set us free today, amen? But I, I just want, I, I am going to speak for a moment against the legacy because it's affected every man in this room. It's affecting just about every young person in our culture because of the access we have to, to, a, to a pornified culture. The church of Playboy created a culture that turns men into immature boys who see women as objects, who are incapable of intimacy, incapable of life-term monogamy, and with many damaged souls, it makes it very hard to worship God. You can usually tell someone, a Christian who's struggling with it because it's very hard to worship. It's very hard to be there. It's very hard to hear the word of God speak in a, a, into, into your soul because there's shame all over us when those things have gripped our heart. Pornography makes men to be immature boys and women as playthings. And I just want to say, we object in Jesus' name. But we also say, not from a position of being on a high horse, but we also say, help us, Lord. Restore us, Lord, because every family has been affected by this sinfulness that appears in such a shiny package. And so many celebrities say, oh, the Hef was cool and everything. No, he was not. He was an immature person. He never grew up. He was a Peter Pan. He, he kept wearing his pajamas all day long. <laughs> he was a little boy trying to think that he was a big man, but he was not. And, and if we think for a moment that he's got it and that's some kind of heaven, let me tell you, he created a hell for millions of people. Uh, there is an addiction to pornography across the culture that is tragic. And if that's something that's a stronghold in your life, can I just say, Jesus Christ can set you free. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but let me tell you something. It's a battle that you must win or you will not be able to worship. You'll miss your destiny if it's grabbed hold of you. It may be someone that you know. It may be a spouse. It may be something that's not even known to you, but we know that the effect of the whole Playboy culture has a very powerful effect in, in our land. The LGBTQ agenda, which has been in itself fueled by pornography, is accepted by so many uncritically. If the LGBTQ say it, well, that is the voice that we must all bow down to. There's no protection in culture anymore for those who object and who point out that at the end of the conveyor belt of immorality is abortion, despite what the scripture says, despite what the science tells us that there is a baby inside that womb. So to me, the legacy of Hefner is death. The wages of sin is death. The hope is that the gift of God is eternal life. And yes, 
it ultimately makes us cynical when we've looked at those words there, that there is error and impure motive and trickery and flattery and mask and greed, and that can make us cynical. But can I say it, my friend, it's possible to be pure in Jesus Christ. Many here have a testimony that God has set us free. And for that we say, hallelujah, glory to God. Let Jesus Christ set you free from the power of Satan in this world today. It's possible to be pure in Christ. Can I have an amen on that? In the name of Jesus, we have the victory. There is hope. There is hope. And I tell you what, bring that prayer to the altar. Not like, oh, if I come to the altar, everyone will know I'm into grave, grave impurity. Hey, everybody's been into impurity. I encourage you to come forward and stand in the name of Jesus and say, God, save us as a culture. Save us as a nation. Save us as a church. Save us as a community. Fourthly, Paul was an entrusted envoy. Verse 4, on the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God who tests our heart. Let's make sure that we don't try to please people, but we try to please God. But you'll see again, it is possible to be a trustworthy man of God. It is possible to be a trustworthy woman of God approved by the Lord. Take your stand in Jesus' name. It's your identity. I'm a child of God. I'm a man of God. I'm a woman of God, tested and approved by Him. We reject insincerity. We reject lust. We reject the forms of worldliness all around about us, and we step into our destiny as entrusted envoys. And then verse 6, we give glory to God. Everyone say glory to God. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. I mentioned the conduct of worship because it's really important that we make a priority to worship God. You know, if every one of our church members came to church, we'd have to have multiple services, multiple services at both campuses. If we made it a priority all the time to worship Him all the time, to bring our, our friends along, we would see a revival in this community. This would be the talk of what's going on in the community. We wouldn't be talking about all the other trivial stuff. We wouldn't be talking about anything except Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, when we gather, I encourage you to sing to the Lord. Brother, sing to the Lord. I know sometimes it can be like this. You know, it's like, we're singing like the greatest words, like, Glory to God, you're worthy of all praise. You're worthy of praise. And it's like, I, okay, I know what that's like sometimes. But, but come prepared. Come willing to, to kind of be really, really humble and not worry what anyone else thinks about you. And if you're going to stand there, raise your hand a little bit. You know what I mean? Raise your hand a little bit. And the Bible says, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands without wrath or downing. Hey, let's just try that. Everyone, just lift your hands to the Lord. The Bible says, without arguing. Hey, isn't that good? Hey, you're all smiling back right now as well. So, so come prepared, enthusiastic. I'm praying that these front rows will be filled. They're the smallest rows of all, aren't they? There's big rows at the back. I'm praying all these rows will be filled and we'll be ready to praise Him and worship Him. Glory to God in the highest. And finally, I think you're going to love this one. Look at verse 7, a very tender and intimate verse. Paul says, instead, this is really interesting, from this mighty apostle, this is Saul of Tarsus, converted, he goes, we were like young children among you. What does that mean? What does it mean to be like, we were like young children among you? Does that mean like Paul and Barnabas started running around or something? And, and, and doing silly things. Now, there's a difference between being childish and childlike. Do you agree with me? And, and you know which one he's talking about. He's not talking about being childish. He's talking about being childlike. And I thought, if we can just park out here for a few moments, I think you'll really love this. It's going to warm your heart. It's going to remind you of who you are in Christ. It's going to remind us of who we are in relationship to him. You know, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 3, this is all on the screen. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. First, Paul has a childlike testimony. Very simple. I was the worst of sinners, and I met the risen Lord. I know that I'm at my best when I remember the kid that didn't go to church didn't know Jesus, whose dad was about to kill himself, and then a punk rocker told me about Jesus, and I came to know him. I've never got, quite got over the fact that God just grabbed hold of me. 
And I think I'm supposed to park out in that place with childlike simplicity, remind myself and remind others that Jesus is the answer for the world today. Paul had a childlike testimony and he told the message across Macedonia and Achaia, Jesus, 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 Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. The apostle Paul and his team had a childlike peace. They were peacemakers. They brought the peace of Jesus Christ. They brought peace to the church, that things were reconciled. Things were not pushed apart by Paul, but things came together again by him. Matthew 19, verse 13. When people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them, but the, dis the disciples rebuked them. Thirdly, Paul a childlike status. We were like children among you, which means uh, he was humble. He didn't puff himself up. He was ordinary, if you like. And he was in a right relationship with the living God. The Roman world said that a child had no standing or no rights. And Paul says, I was a child among you. Matthew 21, 15. When the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things Jesus did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Fourthly, Paul and his team brought childlike praise. In fact, verse 2, the very time when they mentioned the oppression that they experienced in Philippi, what were Paul and Silas famous for doing? They sang while they were in the stocks with beaten backs blood running down their bodies. What did they do? They praised the name of the Lord our God. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ our King. They praised God. They sang out to him and made a sweet sound in that prison cell. Can you see that there was a childlikeness to them that was quite glorious. And it actually warms my heart to them. It warms my heart to the things of God. Now, there is such a thing as childish. Childish preference, Matthew eleven sixteen. 16. To what can I compare this generation? They're like the children sitting in the marketplaces, calling out to others. We played the pipe for you, you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. There are some, sadly, who just seem to get caught up and snagged by personal preference. Things are just not the way we want them to be and we're picky. It's like this isn't like this and my church used to be like that and you know, my former spouse was like that and my dad used to do this and it's like things are just not the way we want them to be and we end up being picky. You know, most people leave a church over personal preference. It's not over doctrine. It's not over weighty matters. It's often over kind of childish stuff that is just about me. Then there's childish rebellion. Brother will rebel will betray brother to death, the father his child, children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Can you see that Paul was really clear, we were like children among you. He's talking about the childlike stuff, not the childish stuff. And so that's a challenge for us, isn't it? But I think it's an encouragement. You know when we're childlike, I think there's quite a lot of fun that goes with that. I thank God that in our church's legacy, we had Ike Reichardt, who is frankly the most fun pastor there's been in the history of the world. I think that was good for our church. We learned to laugh at ourselves. John Avon, a wonderful sense of humor. He was more the kind of guy that would jump out in the corridor and shout boo at you. You know, that kind of, John, John had a great sense of fun as well. I think that's been part of our church culture for many, many years. Let's not take ourselves too seriously. We don't have to get into everything that's going on in the world and let the world set the agenda. We're called to be the happiest people on earth. We're called to be as little children who worship God. We're set free from the power of lust. We're set free from the power of political intrigue and backbiting in our culture. We're set free to be a people of praise, a people of love, a people of ministry, childlike following Jesus. So what I'd like us to do is to just see our main six points again. I haven't done this for a, for a while. Can we just see them on the screen right now? And I want you to, I know these are all relevant to every one of us, but I wonder which, if you had to pick one of those six things, which of those six things do you think, you know what, I think that's most relevant to my life right now. I probably need to work on, on that the most. Is it the right results? Is it service and Christ-like character and witness? Is it just reminding myself what New Testament Christianity is all about? Is it paying the price? Is it, you know what? I get a bit caught up in my own little routine and I sometimes forget I've got to lay myself out there for the kingdom. 
Is it sincerity that, maybe is it, I've got to guard myself against the insincerity of the world and make sure that my heart is pure and I trust those who are sincere? Is it, uh, I've got to be an entrusted envoy? I'm a carrier of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is it, I've got to give glory to God? I need to really give more attention to consistently, persistently glorifying God and worshiping Him. Or is it like, you know, I mustn't lose that sense of childlike simplicity and guard against the childishness that wells up inside of every one of us. Wow, each one of those, that would be victory if we could make progress in any of one, one of those things. But I